hello guys hello friends hello jesus your boy again falling with a star so guys today i want us to look at contraction and also <coughs> action potential in what in skeletal muscle smooth muscle and also what cardiac muscle so this is the structure of what the skeletal muscle this is the structure of the heart the cardiac muscle this is the structure of what the smooth muscle so let's look at the difference between these muscles when you take the skeletal muscle it is striated due to the arrangement of what the myofilament they give the skeletal muscle the striation what appearance the smooth muscle it is smooth that means it is not what striated the cardiac muscle is what striated the skeletal muscle is non-branching when you look at the structure it's non-branching but when you look at the smooth muscle it is also non-branching but when you look at the cardiac muscle you can see that they are branched so they are being joined to each other by this intercalated discs which when we look at the action potential or the contraction, you get to know that it contains the intercalated disc contains what? Gap junction. The skeletal muscle is voluntary. We can control it on our own. But the smooth muscle is involuntary. You cannot control your GIT. The cardiac, the heart, you cannot control. So it is involuntary. The skeletal muscle, as I said, it is multinucleated. The smooth muscle is what? Uninucleated. And the cardiac muscle is also what? Uninucleated. Nerve supply to the what the skeletal muscle is what somatic, but nerve supply to the smooth muscle is what automatic. You see that the automatic nerve supply, the motor automatic motor nerve, <coughs> is being divided into two. We have the sympathetic and what the parasympathetic. You understand? The cardiac muscle to the nerve supply is what automatic. There is absence of auto autonomy. When, when we say there is absence of autonomy, that means the skeletal muscle, they cannot fire or they cannot initiate their own action potential. They can only initiate their own action potential by the help of what nerve supplies. But when you take, when you take the smooth muscle, they have this autonomy that they them themselves can what, initiate their own what, action potential without the help of any, what, any nerve supply. The same applies to the, what, the cardiac muscle. So, for instance, you see that this is the sympathetic nerve, the parasympathetic nerve. These are the autonomic nerves, right? The autonomic motor nerves. In the absence of these nerves, in the absence of these nerves, so the cardiac muscle can what initiate its own action potential. These sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves are there just to regulate the what the contraction of what the skeletal muscle can increase the contraction or increase the action potential or decrease what the action potential so the sympathetic they increase the action potential leads to what more contraction and the parasympathetic decrease the action potential leads to what less what contraction the same applies to what the smooth muscle in the absence of these sympathetic and parasympathetic they can still initiate what the action potential and cause what contraction and in the skeletal, uh, in the cardiac muscle, they are able to initiate their own action potential by the help of these nodes. We have the sino, uh, sino atrial node and the atrioventricular node. They are not nerves, but they act as nerves. They can initiate what action potentials in the what in the skeletal muscle. The same applies to the what the the smooth muscle, which can be found in our GIT. They have this myanteric, the myanteric. And this myotary can initiate what an action potential in the what in the smooth muscle. You understand? Yeah, that's why they have the autonomy. Troponin is present in skeletal muscle, troponin is absent in smooth muscle, and troponin is what present in cardiac muscle. What is the function of this troponin? You see, this troponin it consists of three subunits. We have troponin C, troponin T, troponin I. Calcium binds to this troponin C. When calcium binds to this troponin C, it is going to cause this troponin to undergo a conformational change. And what is the essence of the conformational change that this troponin is undergoing? You see, this troponin is bind to something we call tropomyosin. It uses the troponin T to bind to this green thing you are seeing here is the tropo what? The tropomyosin. And it is being bound to what this troponin. And the troponin use the troponin T to bind to the what the tropomyosin. And this tropomyosin, you see these dark places. We call that dark places myosin binding sites. And that's where the head of what the thick filament, which is called myosin, will bind to to cause the sliding effect. And this tropomyosin has blocked this dark what places where the head of what the myosin can bind to. 
So when this troponin undergoes a conformational change, it causes the tropomyosin to also undergo a conformational change. And it causes the tropomyosin to expose the binding site, the myosin binding site. So that the head of what the myosin, which we call the cross bridge, can bind to that part and cause the sliding effect, which will lead to what contraction. But in the smooth muscle, we said that there is no what troponin, but it contains camodulin. So camodulin acts like the troponin. So let's look at something here. This is carmodulin, the carbodulin. This carmodulin can also bind to what calcium, but it binds to what for calcium. And the calcium carmodulin complex that will be formed can go and activate this structure here called caldesmon. This caldesmon is bind to what the tropomyosin. So when this calcium car carmodulin complex binds to the caldesmon to activate it, it will undergo a conformational change. And that will affect the tropomyosin because it is attached to the tropomyosin. So it's called, it will cause the tropomyosin to also undergo what a conformational change, thereby exposing the what the myosin binding site for the head of the myosin to bind to it to cause the sliding effect. You get it? You understand? And the sliding effect is due to the thick filament, which is called the myosin, pulling the thin filament towards the M line. So the thick filament will pull this thin filament towards what the M line. And that will lead to what the contraction. You understand? And in the skeletal muscle, there is gap junction. And there is no gap junction. Gap junction is absent. But in the smooth muscle, they have what gap junction. Gap junction is present. In the cardiac muscle, gap junction is present. So let's look at the benefit of this gap junction. You see this gap junction. Whenever there is contraction, let's say that these are smooth muscles. This is a smooth muscle. This is a smooth muscle. This is a smooth muscle. When an action potential is generated in this smooth muscle, by the help of this gap junction, which we call nexting, we call this gap junction also, I think, nexting or something, yeah. So, it will cause the action potential to travel to the other, what, other smooth muscles. So, it will cause all the smooth muscles to contract at the same time, which we call inside to, you understand, to contract simultaneously. So the smooth muscles are able to contract simultaneously by the help of this gap junction. But in the skeletal muscle, it is absent. So each skeletal muscle will contract on its own. You understand? Yeah. So that's it. So guys, let's look at the skeletal and the cardiac muscle. The contraction in the skeletal and the cardiac muscle is similar. So let's look at how the contraction is being done. You see, this is how the myofilaments are being arranged. So these are the thin filaments. And the dark ones are the what the thick filament, and you can see the heads of what the thick filament. It has what two heads. You understand? It has two heads. And from this part to this part, we call it the H zone. From this part to this part, this end, this end, the end of this thin filament to the end of this thin filament, we call it the H zone. You understand? At that part, you can only see the thick filament. You understand? And at the H zone, we have this M line. You understand and from this part to this part we call it the eye band the part that consists of only the thin filament we call it what the eye band so in contraction you can see say these thick filaments are pulling this thin filament towards what the m line so they are pulling towards the m line pulling this towards the m line pulling this towards the m line so you can see there the thin filament and the thick filament their length wouldn't change it will remain the same but it is the edge zone that is going to decrease because this whole thing is the A zone, and now you are pulling this to this side, pulling this to this. So the A zone will what will decrease, and now the I band will also decrease because you are pulling this to this side. So the place that consists of only thin filament will also what decrease, but the length of the thick and the thin filament will remain the what the same. The same. Understand? So let's look at how the contraction is being done. So guys, as I was saying. Before even the contraction, there must be an action potential. Before you light up a bulb, there must be an electricity. So this is the case that the action potential is going to travel on the surface of what the muscle called the sarcolemma. To the time that it will reach the T-tubo, which we call the transverse tubo. And this transverse tubo will direct the action potential to the what? The inside of what? The muscle. Specifically to the what? Endoplasmic reticulum. But this is the case that the T tubo has a certain receptor which is very sensitive to the action potential, which we call the dihydropyridine receptor. And this dihydropyridine receptor 
it is being joined to another receptor which is being found on the surface of what the endoplasmic reticulum called ranodine what receptor so you can see say they are being joined together you understand so any conformational change in the dihydropyridin receptor will lead to a conformational change in the ranodine receptor too you understand because they are being linked together by electrical dense feet you understand so this dihydropyridin receptor which is on the t-tubule will undergo a conformational change when it sends the action potential and it will cause the ranodine receptor to also undergo what a conformational change which will lead to the release of calcium you see one function of the endoplasmic reticulum is the storage of calcium so it will lead to the what the release of calcium from what the endoplasmic reticulum and this calcium you see this calcium will go and bind to the what the troponin we are talking about skeletal and cardiac muscle so we we are looking at troponin so the calcium will bind to the troponin the specific part it will bind to is the troponin c and when it binds to the troponin it will cause the troponin to undergo a conformational change and you know that the troponin is also attached to what the tropomyosin which actually blocks the what the myosin binding site on the actin when the muscle is in the relaxed state so the calcium will bind to the troponin, troponin will undergo a conformational change and it's attached to the tropomyosin. The tro tropomyosin will also undergo a conformational change, thereby exposing the myosin binding sites on the actin so that the head of the heart, the myosin can bind to the what the myosin what binding site. So let's look at how the head binds to what the myosin binding site. So you see the myosin has two heads. And this head, you know, they have two binding sites. They have ATP binding site and also actin binding sites. The, the sites that will bind to the actin and the sites that will bind to ATP. The sites that will bind to the ATP also have an ATPase activity, has an enzyme activity which we call the ATPase activity, meaning that it is able to break ATP down to what ADP and inorganic phosphate. So what happens is that ATP will go and bind to the what ATP binding site of what the myosin head and this will decrease the myosin head affinity for what the myosin binding site on the actin you understand so when ATP binds it loses affinity for what the active site with the myosin binding site you understand and this head and it has ATPase activity so it will break the ATP down to what ADP and inorganic phosphate so after the breakdown of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate, this will actually increase the affinity of the head for what the myosin binding site. So when ATP binds, low affinity. When ATP, ATP is being broken down to ADP and inorganic phosphate, then it increases its activity for what the myosin binding site. So the head will attach to that myosin binding site on the actin. You understand? So they will attach to that place. And after the attachment, of what the head of what the myosin which we even call it the cross bridge the inorganic phosphate will be released and the release of the inorganic phosphate actually causes the power stroke which is the sliding effect the movement of what the actin over what the myosin the movement of what the thin filament over the thick filament which is the sliding what effect you understand which will lead to what contraction so that's for <clears throat> That's for skeletal and what cardiac muscle, you understand? And for realization to okay, the calcium are being pumped back to what the endoplasmic reticulum and also into the extracellular fluid by what calcium ATP is pump. Calcium ATP is pump. There can also be sodium calcium pump. It can also help pump what calcium to what the extracellular fluid. Thereby, when calcium concentration drops, it leads to what realization, you understand? Yeah. So now let's look at for the smooth muscle. For the smooth muscle, the difference is that in the smooth muscle we don't have what troponin, but we have carmodulin. You understand? So it is the 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 it is it is the carmodulin that the calcium will bind to, and this carmodulin needs four calcium. So the calcium one, two, three, four. So four calcium will bind to this carmodulin, and the calcium carmodulin complex will go and activate this structure we call caldes the caldesmon. It is caldesmon rather, not caldesmon. Caldesmon, you understand? And when it activates this caldesmon, this caldesmon is attached to tropomyosin. So this caldesmon will undergo what a conformational change, leading the tropomyosin to also undergo a conformational, a conformational change, thereby exposing the what the myosin binding site, so that the head of the myosin can bind to that site. You understand? After that, it follows 
what I said here, ATP will bind towards the head, then it will reduce the affinity, then the ATP will be broken down to ADP and inorganic phosphate, which will increase its affinity for the myosin binding site, and the release of the inorganic phosphate will cause the power stroke, which is the sliding effect. So here, the release of the inorganic phosphate will cause the what? The sliding effect. So these are the thin filaments, the one that looks like C, thin filament, and the dark one in the middle is the what? The thick filament. So the thin filament, the thick filament will move the thin filament towards the M line, which is the center. And when it pulls the <coughs> Thin filament. Note that this thin filament they are being joined to this deep dots here, which we call dense bodies. We call them the dense bodies. So this thin filament will pull on the dense bodies. So the thin filament is being <coughs> joined to the dense bodies by these lines here. We call them the intermediate fat filament. So it will pull on the dense bodies and it leads to shrinkage, which is the contraction of what the smooth muscle. You understand? So now, guys, let's look at. Action potential in the cardiac muscle, which is very simple. In the cardiac muscle, we have two types of muscles. We have the pacemaker muscles and we have the non-pacemaker muscles. One thing about the cardiac muscle, and I said when I was comparing the muscles, I said that they exhibit autonomy. They can initiate their own what action potential, and that is being done by the pacemaker what uh, the pacemaker cells. You understand? Which is SV node. AV node, bundle of haze, and pancreatic fibers. They act like nerves, but they are not nerves. You understand? So the SV node is the first one that will actually generate the action potential. So the SV node will this SV node. So the SV node will generate the action potential, and the SV node is being present in the right atrium. After generating the action potential, it will give the action potential to what? To the right atrium and also the left atrium and also to what this node here this node we call it the av node let me add the e av node so the sv node after the generation of the action potential it generates it on its own it supplies the right atrium the muscles in the right atrium and the muscle in the left atrium with that action potential and also gives the action potential to what the av node and this AV node will relax, will wait for a while, like, let me say, uh, 1 microsecond or 0 0.5 microsecond. And this is for the blood in the, what, the right atrium to move towards the left, uh, to the, uh, the blood in the, what, the atrium to move towards the ventricles, uh, to the ventricles, you understand? Ha! Huh. So it is waiting for what the blood to what, get to the, ventri uh, the ventricles there. The right ventricle and what the left ventricle to be filled with, with blood. That's why it wait for a while. You understand? After that, this AV node will give the action potential to what the bundle of his. And this bundle of his will supply, will give the what the action potential to what to the pancreatic fibers. This is the pancreatic fibers. So this is the bundle of his. And this is the pancreatic fibers. And this pancreatic fibers we have the right branch and we have the left <coughs> we have the right branch and we have the left branch the right branch will give the action potential to what the right the muscles in the right ventricle and the left branch will give the action potential to the what the muscles in the what in the left what ventricle you understand and contraction of the atrium occurs at the same time to side to simultaneously and the contraction of what the ventricles also occurs it, at the same time so when the atrium when they are contracting the ventricles are relaxing when the ventricles are contracting the atrium are what, relaxing you understand so that's it so guys now let's look at the action potential for the non pacemaker and what for the pacemaker for the non pacemaker the action potential involves what four phases zero one two three and what four you understand so let's start with phase zero and the resting memory potential for the non pacemaker is what negative 90 millivolts so let's start with phase zero because when you're counting numbers we start with zero so the zero which is the depolarization phase you understand see negative 90 millivolts we are moving towards the positive side so this is depolarization and this and this is due to what sodium what influx and this sodium influx is very fast you understand it's very fast and let's look at phase one. Phase one is due to the inactivation of what the sodium gated or voltage gated channels. 
after the inactivation of the sodium voltage gated channels there will be the opening of what potassium voltage gated channels and also chloride what voltage gated channels so the potassium and chloride you know, will start moving out of what the cell you understand so if last so this is due to if last of what potassium and chlorine and also sodium channel at inactivation let's look at phase two which we call the plateau phase the plateau phase is due to calcium influx and potassium efflux so the calcium influx and potassium efflux will balance you understand and this will give you the constant thing here which we call the plateau phase the constant phase called the plateau phase and due to uh, calcium efflux and potassium efflux balance uh, they are balanced you understand yeah so let's look at phase three phase three is the repolarization repolarization you can see here because we are moving from the positive side towards the negative side so there's the repolarization and this is due to the closure of what the voltage gated calcium channels and also after the closure of what the voltage gated calcium channels this is the case that the potassium gated channels will still remain open so there will still be if last of what the potassium and this bring this will bring the what the repolarization that we are seeing here so the time that we reach phase four which is the resting memory potential part where the exclusion of what the potassium what gated channels so the exclusion of what potassium what voltage gated channels and this gives us the resting memory potential and this is also being maintained by the sodium potassium what pump the sodium potassium pump you understand so that's for the non pacemaker action potential let's look at the pacemaker action potential this involves three phases zero three and four zero three and four and phase zero let's start with phase zero you see here you know, the depolarization was due to the what sodium influx but here the depolarization is due to what calcium influx by the l type calcium voltage gated channels you understand and also some sodium influx but this the sodium influx is very slow which we call the funny current you understand we call the funny current you understand so the phase zero which the depolarization is due to what calcium what influx through the l type voltage gated calcium channels and also sodium influx which is very slow so we call it the funny current and phase three is the repolarization similar to similar to what we look to, uh, we look at here so the calcium the calcium voltage gated channels will close but there will be what potassium voltage gated channels been opening and there will be what potassium what efflux you understand and that will bring about the phase three which is the repolarization and then phase four the closure of what the voltage gated potassium what channels and it's also being maintained by what the sodium sodium potassium what atp is pump you understand so that's it thank you